Ignition sequence start. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9. Guidance is internal. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All systems go. All systems go. I want to welcome all of our missionaries back from the Dominican. There's several of them in this room right now. Give it up. And we'll be sharing more of what was accomplished there in the coming weeks, but we're glad they're back. So today I am in uh, the third week of our series on the Holy Spirit. And this is your first time here, just relax. Um, we're all friends, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, today I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, and this is the third week of a series called Controlled Burn. What is a controlled burn? A controlled burn is good fire that sets a barrier and is used for a okay? You know, firefighters will set a controlled burn to, 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 to keep the bad fire at bay. Um, scientists use a controlled burn to launch rockets to the moon. The Holy Spirit is a controlled burn. It's, it's passion, it's fire, it's power with a purpose in the life of a believer. That's what we're talking about. And today I wanna to talk to you about what the Holy Spirit did in the early parts of the church. And I wanna bring you to two big understandings today about your life and about this church. Now, I have to confess to you, I preached in the video and got real angry and started spitting, and, and there was nobody, I was just preaching to the camera at the time, but got all fired up, so I've been thinking, I don't know how that's all gonna play, but I'm gonna try to be a lot nicer today in the live service. I just got so angry at the devil, I just wanted him to know it through the video camera, I guess, I don't know. Uh, so, just like the world now, the world in the time of the early church was just as divided as this world we live in, if not worse. They were under an occupation of Rome. Um, there was religious tension. There was political tension. There were separated people groups. There was a lot of animosity and a lot of just tension. And so into that environment, the Lord Jesus died and the Holy Spirit birthed the church. The church was born in the early book of Acts. And... Um, I love the church, I make no apologies, I'm a local church guy. Like I believe the local church, just like Bill Heibel said many years ago, I believe the local church is the hope of the world. Strong local churches that are ingrained in the fabric of their community, that are connected to the hearts of people, that's, that's God's hope for the world, that's his mission, that's what we're all about. And so, um, you know, uh, when I say the word church, I don't know what comes to your mind, it might be building, it might be it might be choir robes, it might be lit liturgy, it might be, it might be dudes in dresses speaking. Uh, I don't know, like I'm not wearing a robe up here, it ain't gonna happen unless we just have a super casual Sunday. But robes are so hot, honestly, like have you ever tried to wear one around the house? I sweat, it's not good. Um, but in that early church, there was a, there was a, a, a defining factor of the church that, that made it to where none of them were bored in the first century, none of them were trying to figure it out. When they heard the word church, robes, rows, bands, Bibles, or banners, <laughs> those are all B words in case you're wondering. I work hard on this stuff, people. Um, the church was simply a gathering of people. It was people gathered together with a common belief, Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are empowered and strengthened to live out the mission of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And so that word, that Greek word for church is the word ecclesia. And for years it was translated wrong to where they thought the word church meant building or a group of far off decision makers looking down their nose at you, telling you how to live. And that's how people thought the church was to be uh, interpreted. But, but there was a guy who came along named William Tyndale. And here's a picture of him. This is actually a Polaroid picture of William Tyndale in the 16th century, and he had the ability, he's called the father of the English Bible. He took the Bible from, 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 from Greek and brought it to English. He's the father of the English Bible, and it was scandalous, and the church hated him because he put the knowledge of the word in the hands of common people. And he, got, he was kind of a gangster. He kind of he was kind of uh, incendiary because he looked at the bishops of the Church of England and he said, it is my desire to make that boy running a plow over there just as much a scholar of the word of God as you are. 
They're like, oh, that's what you think. They burned him at the stake. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Kill him! Murder him! In the name of religion. So in 1536, he was burned at the stake, but one of the scandalous things he did was he interpreted the word church as congregation, as a gathering of people, not as a... uh, a building or a list of rules or a a group of far-off people that controlled everything, he interpreted the church as people, the hearts of people, the hearts of people set on fire, the hearts of people unified and intertwined with one another. And they hated him for that. And uh, it's a good translation, though, because uh, the Lord Jesus isn't trying to build buildings. We can have church under a tent. He's trying to build people. Buildings are kind of necessary if you want to sit in air conditioning. But... Uh, that's not what he died for, okay? And so the earliest mention um, of, this, of this church that he was starting out was when he talked to Simon Peter. He said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he's like, that's right. And you are Simon Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build my people. I will build my congregation. So this is uh, the heart of God to build something. Do you think that that there's not a mission behind what Jesus did. There's not a high purpose that matters more than any other purpose. That high purpose that matters more than any other purpose actually has the key to all the fulfillment in the world. So many people are bored. So many people are seeking for something that truly matters. The only thing that matters is what you do that affects eternity. Because if you look at the scope of time and how you know, how, how long human history is. We're just here for a, a flicker of, of a moment of time. What you do for eternity matters more because eternity is, is, is a long time. And so in verse um, 8, when Jesus is ascending up to heaven, he tells them, look, I am, I am going to help you with my mission. I'm going to empower you for my mission. And in verse 8, he says this. He's like, look, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And they're like, oh, great, awesome, awesome power. I've been in New York City. My voice has just changed. I can't help it. Oh, power, it's going to be so great. Hey, Charlie, we're going to have power. What's the power for? What's the power for? Well, we want to be kind of weird and freaky and walk around and be like, hey. What's the power for? What's the reason behind the power? Honestly. And so he goes on to say, and you'll be my witnesses. So the power is tied to witnessing of something. What is that witness? Well, he said, my witnesses. So witnesses of him, and you're going to be in Jerusalem. And that's great. We love Jerusalem. We're all Jews. All the people listening to this were Jews. We love Jerusalem. This is our hometown. Isn't that great? And in all Judea. Oh, that's a little farther away, but we're good with that. Samaria. What? No, we hate those people. (laughs) Yeah, no, we really hate those people. Those people are not worthy to be liked. You know, Samaritans, they, they caused a lot of us to be killed. We actually hate Samaritans because whenever wars come, you know, Samaritans were half Jews and half Gentiles, and they would just be like, okay, who's going to win here? We need odds on this coming battle. Oh, it's two to one odds? Okay, we'll go with the favorite. And many times that wasn't the Jews. And so the Jews are like, we hate them, and that's why the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told was so scandalous back in the day, all right? So, and then he says, into the ends of the earth. Well, what? No, he doesn't really mean that. The ends of the earth? Nah. <laughs> nah, we'll just worry about Jerusalem. Well, Jesus wanted them to teach what he taught, to baptize the way he baptized, and to do it with the power that he would give them in the future, in this moment, and be witnesses of him to the ends of the earth, okay? So they went back to Jerusalem, They went into an upper room and they began to seek God and pray and worship and and, and turn their hearts and their focus completely. I'm getting Instagrammed. I just want to give them something to look at. (laughs) Devote their hearts completely to God in that moment. What's that going to look like? Like I'm, I'm doing bird impressions is what I just did. That's so incredibly random. Understand what's going on here. They... Heard from him, okay, you're going to give us power at a future point, and so we're going to go, and the Bible used the word tarry, okay? It's not a word we use very often, but it's a word that says wait and focus. 
Wait and focus, wait and pray. And then the promise was that you'll be given power from on high, okay? And so this happened. They went to an upper room in Jerusalem. They're gonna seek God and you can read about it. I don't have time to read you the whole Bible, but in Acts chapter two, it's all there. They began to seek God and the sound of a rushing mighty wind came and the Bible says divided tongues of fire sat on their head and they began to speak in other tongues and they went out into the streets and when they went out into the streets where all these religious Jews were gathered for something called the Feast of Pentecost, they began to speak of the glorious and miraculous works of God in the 14 different native tongues of the people that had gathered together in Jerusalem for that day. And, and it was a bunch of different people. It, it, it describes it here in the book of Acts chapter two, verse eight. Um, they were amazed, like how are these Galileans speaking all these languages? It was a spirit-empowered speech that allowed them to, you know, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have a way to put a post up that, and they didn't have Google Translate. The Holy Spirit just did it. And so here's a portion. I'm not gonna read them all and I'm not gonna pronounce them all right. Come on, somebody. But verse eight. And they're, they're shocked because they hear all this. And how can, how can we hear uh, in our native languages? Okay, so they're Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, and it goes on, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask to one another, what does this mean? All right, let me tell you something. From day one, even though the Holy Spirit was poured out on Jews in the book of Acts chapter two, from day one, the mission and movement of the church was quickly translated to be able to be spread throughout the known world into 14 different languages at that time. The Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, the Holy Spirit in the life of anybody is there to empower you for a greater mission. so that the message of Jesus can move forward with supernatural power that's not of your own. The inertia of God, like you ever, you ever drive a big truck? Come on, somebody. Oh, I know you ladies out there. No, seriously, you ever drive a truck with a load on it? And you go to brake and you realize there's something pushing me. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to break into Jake brake. Come on, somebody, Jake brake it! Like, you have, to, you have to break harder because there's something pushing you. And that's what the Holy Spirit was doing in that moment. It was pushing. It was behind them. It was, it was giving them strength and knowledge that was not their own for a bigger mission and a bigger purpose. And you're no better and you're no worse than them. God wants to do the same thing in your life and in mine to use his spirit to be behind you and, and, and push you and help you to do things. If you're a believer, if you're not a believer, you need to go to meet Jesus. And that's, but if you're a believer, it's the Spirit of God moving behind you, pushing you forward for a purpose. It's empowerment for mission. It's nothing, it's empowerment for mission, okay? And so um, Peter had to explain it, and he got up and he said in Acts uh, 2 and 22, fellow Israelites, check that, fellow Israelites, so this early movement of Christians was just for Jews. Now, I was, I don't know if I told y'all, but I've been doing some world travels. I was in New York City. Yeah, we get out every 20 years. We, uh, we like to go and see, you know, we just, we didn't even have to use passports. We just, we haven't traveled much. Paget Interstate Ministries has not gone very far. We've stayed right here. But. I saw some Orthodox Jews in New York, and I'm fascinated by Israel and, I, and the conflicts in the Middle East, and I study about them a lot, and just in my free time, amen. And uh, they're a closed society. Orthodox Jews are a closed society. Matter of fact, I called years ago to ask a few questions. I called the local synagogue of the Jews in this uh, city, and I'm, I'm not throwing stones, I'm just telling you my experience. I asked a couple questions. And the man that I asked the question to said this in this exact tone of voice, you're either fish or fowl. You cannot be both. Which meant, you're a non-Jew. I'm not gonna answer your questions. Have a good day, sir. <laughs> Don't, 
That hurt. That hurt my feelings. You hurt my heart. But the Jewish faith is a, it's based on, I mean, it's a religion and it's a nationality. And so in order to be a Jew, unless you decide to convert, and usually that happens because you've married a Jewish person, like it is not an open society. And the Orthodox Jews are most closely doing what contemporary Jews who are waiting on the Messiah, who don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, that's kind of what they should be doing. They're keeping the old elements of the law that Christ fulfilled, gave us grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so they, they do a couple things. They wear long, hot, black clothing. The men wear hats that fully cover their head to show that they're under, or they wear a yarmulke. But a lot of the Orthodox use a yarmulke is not enough. They wear a hat that covers the entirety of their head. They do not round. They don't cut off the corners of their beards. So they, get, they have these pigtails kind of things. that They call them something. I don't know what they call them. But they, they come off. It, it's a closed society. They wear prayer tassels underneath their clothing. That, that are garments of, of, of prayer. It is not something that is evangelistic in nature. It is a closed society. And it is not really open to others in the sense that, that, that you would know here, I guess. So, because this is a Israelite Jewish thing, that could present a problem because they're not an open community. The Holy Spirit's purpose was to take this message of Jesus from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. How's he going to do that when all these uttermost parts of the earth hate each other? The Jews hate the people in Samaria. The Samarians, Samaritans, hate the Jews. The Jews hate the Gentiles. The Gentiles have nothing for the Jews, and they can go either way on the Samaritans. There had to be something to bring all these diverse people groups together so that Christianity wouldn't be landlocked in a Jewish-only type of construct. Like, we're just Jews. We're, just Jew we're, we're Jews. That's what we do. Well, let's see what happened. So, I'm going to skip to, I'm not going to skip. I'm going to read it. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. All right. Acts 2 and 22. Fellow Israelites, Peter starts preaching to them. When they said, what does this mean? He's like, Jesus of, Na Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Don't! But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Yeah. Verse 32, whoa, hey, welcome to the courageous church. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. They're seeing these untrained Galileans sharing the miracle working power of God in 14 languages. He's like, that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on in verse 36 and says, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, both Lord and Christ, Contemporary Orthodox Jews today are still waiting for Messiah to come, but he came. His name is Jesus. One claps, everybody claps. Come on. And so when the people heard this message, they were pricked in their hearts. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, verse 37, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, attend church regularly. No. Because Christianity doesn't point toward duty and religious responsibility. It points to heart transformation. It points to a change in your value system. It points to a reckoning of you and God to a place where you're forever changed and transformed. Peter replied, repent, turn from your sin, and be baptized. Baptism is the natural progression of your faith in Christ. you got to go be baptized, just what Christians do. It identifies you with Jesus. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. Verse 41, 
Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Say 3,000. If you don't like big church, you wouldn't have liked the first day of the church. I'm not, numbers aren't everything, but souls are. Souls are. He added the number 3,000 on the day. So 3,000 different people from 14 different languages and people groups believed. And, and, and so now we have the conversion of Jews to Christ. Praise God. But this isn't what Jesus promised. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, I believe the Jews would have made Christianity exclusive. And those modern-day Orthodox Jews somehow bear that out. Today now, in, 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 in truth, much of Israel is non-religious and secular. But they live their life under law. They live their life despising outsiders. They, they, fully, they fully have a rabbi, a man, telling them what is permissible and not permissible. And the women have to wear wigs. Where are my wig women at? Like, I wish we could do it. You don't want to wear wigs? They're, I hear they're hot. I don't know. Haven't worn one lately. They do a lot of ritual hand washings before they eat. And all these things, you know, were a part of the law, which is called the, the, the which, which, which Paul called the schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. It wasn't forever. And so all of this cloistered stuff had to be broken. How is racism and religious inwardness broken? By an empowered mission that takes the church out of your hands. God, and I heard Tommy Barnett say this years ago, and I believe it's true, God's church has to be out of control to grow. We can't run a high-controlled church. When he sets people's hearts on fire, we have to allow the work of God to happen and allow life and grace and freedom that comes to the Spirit to, to have life and not be a high-control, put your thumb on people. And so here's what happened, all right? So that, I told you they hated the Samaritans, but now we just have Jews, but the Samaritans are still on the outside looking in. So verse 14 of Acts chapter 8 says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, somebody went to Samaria and began preaching to Samaritans, and no, <laughs> it wasn't like, they weren't like all going at once. They were kind of like, ah, eh, we'll see what God wants to do. Uh, you know, they weren't super excited about Samaritans. The Jews weren't. But they went to, uh, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria to check this out and verify this. We weren't expecting this. He told us it would happen, but we're not really sure. We didn't really want it to happen. It's happening. Oh, no. Send the bosses to go check it out. They sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. So the Holy Spirit does come on people. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. This is a problem. You have a people group included that they didn't intend to include, even though they were told it was going to happen. Now let's go on. I don't have time to read both to you, but the, it, it wraps it up here in Acts chapter 10. So now we have Samaritans, and then we go to a Gentile, somebody who has no Jewish blood. Samaritans had half Jewish blood, but Gentiles had no Jewish blood. The exclusivity, it, it, there's not even a strand of it. Okay, Acts 10, 34. He's in the house of Cornelius, a man of the centurion band. He was an Italian soldier. He is not a Jew at all. I'm an Italian, ain't no Jewish blood in me, okay? Then Peter began to speak, and he said this in verse 34, after encountering Cornelius, he said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. God does not show favoritism! Do you get that? It had to be said back then, and it has to be said now. God does not show favoritism. Not one family is any more important in God's church. Not one race is any more important in God's church. Not any amount of money is more important in God's church. God shows no favoritism, and that is the basis for making good decisions about the church. I feel better. Okay. I mean, ah! 
lot of churches, it's us and them. And I'm not against churches, but come on. These are the super Christians, and we just tolerate these people. I want to vomit. I, this is not, I'm sure this doesn't look healthy, like what I'm doing here. But I feel it so strong, people, because God's church gets locked up by, by, by prejudices and by the approval of men, and God shows no favoritism. I know I look angry, but I love Jesus and I love you. But doggone it. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation, say every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And he goes on to talk about Jesus and how they killed him and he rose again. And while he's speaking these words in verse 44, put it on the screen. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all the Gentiles who had no Jewish blood who heard the message. Verse, next verse. The circumcised. See, circumcision was all about being a Jew or not being a Jew. Circumcising yourself outwardly. Don't want to get into circumcision today, but that was the sign of being a committed Jew. Circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Next verse. For they had heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. There was a sign when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit that caused the racism of thousands of years to crumble and expl explains why. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized as Christians, as a part of the family with water because they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. God used tongues in that instance in Acts chapter 2 to show that his spirit was poured out on Jews. In Acts chapter 8 with Samaritans, the same thing happened to tear down the racial divisions between Jews and Samaritans. And in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit came and filled Gentiles with the Holy Spirit so that they could not be made outsiders because God shows no favoritism. It is the desire of the Holy Spirit of God to intertwine our hearts so much and connect us so much by his Spirit that we don't know who to hate. I just pulled my back out of place. Let me do a few little stretches here, people. Honestly, he wants to tie us up and intertwine our hearts so much with one another that we no longer know what or who to hate. When I came to this city, there was not one church that had any measure of integration in it. When I came to this city, there wasn't, there wasn't a church that had any remote population in it that wasn't all one race either way. And I walked on this stage and prayed back and forth, pointing out those things I saw in the book of Acts about how people were brought together because of the move of the Spirit. And I want you to know that although Springfield is not a diverse place, he's continuing to do that work. Why? Because the Holy Spirit brings people together. Three minutes. I want to tell you one more thing. I'm going to summarize it. It's in the notes. If you want to see it, you can go watch the video. I didn't get as fired up. I didn't scream as much. I thought I did. I didn't. Acts 15. Here's what happened. Believers who were Gentiles, just like here, were loving, worshiping Jesus, and then Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came and said, this is all great. You love Jesus. It's, we got a little growth track action for you. And in that growth track, we want you all to be circumcised. We'd feel a lot more comfortable if you would uh, act like Jews. Not any growth track I want to be a part of. Still cramping. Need more magnesium. All right. So this is a huge controversy. We see in 2, 8, 10 of Acts that God had brought people together by a work of the Holy Spirit and empowered them for mission. No boredom. 
But now there's controversy. They're saying you need Jesus plus our rules in order for us to receive you. And so the early young church had to come together to make a decision about what should be done. And there were two key things that the Holy Spirit did for people. Let me find them. They're here in the book of Acts chapter 15. It says a couple things. Read Acts 15 later, I'll just tell you. He said, first off, we shouldn't make it hard for people to come to Jesus. Read it. I believe it was James said, we should not make it difficult for people to come to Jesus because of what the Holy Spirit has done in us. And then secondly, he says, we should not put on them any greater burden than a few necessary things. And he spelled out why, okay? And this is the letter they wrote back. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote it back. Acts 15, 19. Based upon the Holy Spirit's work, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles, the people who we had no idea were going to be a part of this. Make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. They sent the following letter, verse 24. We have heard that someone out from you without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds with what they said. Skipping to verse 28 because of time. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit not to bother people, to be inclusive, to have a church that doesn't identify as Democrat, Republican, or anything. You will not come here during election season and hear me get all fired up about a candidate. There won't be any candidates on the stage. We are not into the division of our society. We're into the unity of Christ because of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that we we won't stand up against unrighteousness. But doggone it, the Holy Spirit unifies us and brings us together for a mission. And that mission is Christ. Would you stand with me today? Bow your heads right now. I want to pray over you, and we're going to worship Heavenly Father in this room. There are people that need the divisions in their heart and the divisions in their lives challenged by your Spirit. Father, your Spirit is in the church to bring us to a place of empowered, Spirit-empowered witness. Like, we, we want a mission bigger than the mission that is just about self. Lord, we're trusting you to be the key to fulfillment in life. And Lord, right now in Jesus' name, all over this place, I pray in these next few moments that the truth of what the Spirit does in lives, the unity of the church, the purpose of mission, and the removing of barriers, God, let that get us with everything that your Spirit has. Let's worship God together right now.